Hey, hello, and welcome to Stan Energy Man here on ThinkTech Hawaii. And just to let you know, we're, we're just starting a fundraising drive here at ThinkTech. And uh, us hosts are exorbitantly paid nothing because we're volunteers. So, but it does take some funding to run the studio and uh, keep all of our contracts and our regular full-time employees paid. So if you can support uh, ThinkTech here on uh, and, and Stan Energy Man, we'd appreciate it. As most of the Energy Man's viewers know, I'm a devout believer in hydrogen as part of a clean energy world. But few people know that there's a church devoted to hydrogen known as the Church of the First Element. So today, I'd like to introduce you to the hydrogen faith and its founder, Pastor Paul Pontio. Last week, I visited Paul with a friend of mine, Anthony Alto, and his associate, and we were granted permission to video some of Pastor Paul's sermon slash demonstration. I guess you could call it a kind of a sermonstration. But first, I'd like to introduce you to the Ten Commandments of the Church of the First Element. The first commandment is, Thou shalt recognize hydrogen as the first element on the periodic table. This is a no-brainer, because if you look on a chemistry chart, you'll notice that hydrogen is the first element on the periodic table. So, this is like a church that actually blends science with, with a religion. The second commandment, thou shalt recognize all clean energy technologies and seek how they complement the properties of hydrogen. That's a really important one because there's a lot of great technologies out there and they all seem to complement hydrogen energy storage. The third um, one is thou shalt rebuke Hindenburg storytellers if they call hydrogen the villain. And this is critical because I'd say a good 10% of the people I run into they usually don't tell me anything except, oh, like the Hindenburg or H-bomb, or I get some negative thing. So follow the third commandment. When somebody starts talking Hindenburg, you don't have to hit them, but just kind of give them a clue. The fourth commandment is thou shalt welcome battery technology sparingly, even when the profits of batteries reject, uh, reject hydrogen completely. What you find is most folks that like hydrogen technology really like batteries. We're, we're, we're kind of partial to batteries in the right proportions with the right technology and the right chemistry. But so for some reason, all the battery folks seem to just really get amped up about hydrogen. So you gotta be a believer in hydrogen and batteries. The fifth commandment is thou shalt point out that hydrogen atoms love all and will join all but the satanic atoms. So you'll notice that hydrogen's in all your cool atoms, like uh, the gasoline you put in your car has actually got a lot of hydrogen in it. Um, natural gas that you cook with is, is carbon and hydrogen atoms, that's all. And, you know, even ammonia, which is used in fertilizers and stuff, is just nitrogen and hydrogen. It's great. It's a really friendly, lovable little atom that loves to join with other atoms. That's why you don't find hydrogen by itself in, in nature, except maybe in the sun fueling the stars. But it's a good, friendly, love-endorsing atom. The sixth commandment is thou shalt celebrate hydrogen properties, particularly energy storage and cooking. And we have some video on this one. Thou shalt hold electrolysis above, uh, above all other forms of harvesting hydrogen. That's important because you can get hydrogen from a lot of different ways, including steam reforming methane. But the very cleanest way is to take like solar PV, take the DC power off your solar panels and directly start electrolyzing hydrogen. That's the cleanest way. So we put that one above all else, at least for now, until we figure out different ways to synthesize uh, hydrogen directly from sol sunlight. Today. The eighth commandment is thou shalt preach to all the safety and carbon-free nature of the fuel cell engine. Fuel cell engines are very efficient compared to our internal combustion engines. Internal combustion engines are like 20 to 30% at the very best efficient where fuel cell engines can be in the 50 to 60% efficiency range, especially if you can recapture any of the heat that they produce and use that energy as well. The ninth commandment is thou shalt endeavor to apply hydrogen technology all the days of your life. So that's a lifelong commitment to hydrogen. And it's really, I think, a good commitment. It's a good, clean commitment. And lastly, thou shalt love hydrogen gas as God loves hydrogen, because God must love hydrogen it's the most common element in the entire universe. So he must really like it. So you're right on there. They're pretty easy commandments to stick to, I think. And I, I think they'd be a good, one, good ones to follow. 
So Pastor Paul Pontio, the founder of the Church of the First Element, demonstrated his understanding of accepting battery technology sparingly, that's commandment number four, to some visitors in his laboratory, I mean in his temple last week. So we have a video of Pastor Paul talking to some visitors and hopefully future devotees about, hydro, about battery technology, but the right kind of battery technology. They have 40% more cycle life than cobalt. So the only thing you really, when you look at the cost of battery storage, what you're buying is how many kilowatt hours over its life will it store. That's it. They use lots of metrics to confuse people and snowball things and it's like, so name, name plate price of this is more expensive than the cobalt. Even though the cobalt chemistry is more expensive, it's the scale of manufacturing makes it cheaper. <clears throat> this is 40% longer cycle life. Sony's tested it for 14,000 cycles. That's 100% discharge, 100% recharge every day. So if you did that every day, that's 38 point something years. And they had 70% or 68% capacity after 38 years. So we know this is at least a 20 year battery in the 80% range. And I don't know how to beat that right now with any other technology. Um, they just work. There's zero maintenance. I mean, we joke and we'll do the tour and we get a maintenance kit with every battery. Because <laughs> people are going to touch them to see if they really are hot. And we've got to wipe off all the things. So, you know, joking aside, literally, we haven't touched these batteries except to tighten the bus bar, you know, over time. But never touched the battery since they were installed. So this was the original form factor, generation one. Then they moved to a different format to cut the cost and for efficiency. And that's this module here. So this is a 1.2 kilowatt hour. This is a 2.1. They both use the exact same chemistry, the same cells, the late 650 cells, these green guys. And they just string them in series and parallel to get the voltage if you want. And this is a low voltage system, 48 volt system. You can string them parallel to get high voltage. In fact, we have a megawatt hour sitting outside that's high voltage. Um, but the, the, the nice thing is, it's the same cells, but they're packed more efficiently, so it takes up less space. This is a 60 kilowatt hour. It replaces three of the black cabinets. So it's almost a footprint of one. <coughs> uh, but it's the same cells, it just more efficiently packaged. 60 kilowatt. So I, I have the, the first power wall batteries installed in the Western Hemisphere. No, oh, sorry to hear it. I'm sure you would say that. I, you know, the two of them are bigger than this thing, and of course the two, of, uh, I think they're seven and a half yeah. kilowatt each, so that's and, and four really times. Yeah, and you can't discharge those 100%. I mean, you can, but you'll shorten your life right. dramatically. Um, these are, when we, we talk about cycles, we're talking 100% discharge. And it's really hard to do to get a battery to go down to zero every day. It's really hard. And how much more expensive is it to use these? The initial, initial obviously I understand the lifetime argument you're making, but the initial upfront cost presumably right. is discouraging so people, right? The best way I can explain that is that like, Sony doesn't sell batteries assemblies. They right. sell the components, right? So we're system integrators basically, well, not even here, but our company that sells the batteries, Blue Planet Energy, assembles everything into the cabinets. So this was the first product, and this is a 16 kilowatt hour. Mm -hmm. And it's using the second generation modules. Um, I believe this sells, and I'm not even sure because I don't touch sales, but I think this runs about it's around 15,000, so it's like 900 and something a kilowatt hour. Mm -hmm. You can get cobalt batteries for as low as 300 a kilowatt hour unassembled. By the time you put it in with a battery management system and all that other stuff, you're probably looking at 500. So they're quite a bit more expensive up front, um, but again, they're going to outlast them you know, almost two to one.
So large or small, batteries are not all created equal and all must be looked at for their cradle to grave properties, like safety and environmental impacts of gathering the raw materials and the processing of them into their final form. There's operational safety and actual life cycles. I don't know if you caught that, but Paul was comparing uh, these batteries, which are lithium iron phosphate, not lithium cobalt technology, like in the Tesla wall batteries. But these things can actually be cycled down to zero and back up to full charge, and it doesn't harm the battery or shorten its overall life. Also, all of the end of life components on these are, are um, recyclable. So depth of discharge is important, end of life disposals, disposal issues are important, because current lithium batteries, I mean, like if you have them in your tools and things, you know you have to take them back to Home Depot or Lowe's or wherever you bought the, the batteries and the, and the equipment from to recycle them, and you can't throw them into incinerators. And the current lithium cobalt technology has other uh, heat uh, thermal runaway issues and things that you have to be careful of. But this technology that uh, Pastor Paul is talking about is lithium iron phosphate. A little bit different, like he says, a little more expensive for now, but it's really incredible technology. Other aspects of batteries that are often overlooked is where the raw materials come from. Who's in control of those assets? And do they represent a national security vulnerability if they're not available for us to use in our batteries? So there's a lot to think about when you pick, up, pick batteries. But large or small, a well-designed battery can be a great benefit and can make even better use, uh, make even better use of uh, hydrogen in the long term if you couple batteries with hydrogen technology properly. Hydrogen is great for energy storage, and a lot of people miss that point. I like to think of hydrogen as energy storage primarily. But Pastor Paul shows a great example of how a large, clean battery uh, and its components could be coupled with hydrogen and support a water system, because this is a project that he's actually doing there uh, on his, at his laboratory that shows how a large one megawatt scale battery using that lithium iron phosphate technology can support 24-7, 365, for at least 20 years, a water system that is uh, supplying water to over 250 customers in that area of the Big Island. We were using that second generation module that was sitting inside. And it's actually two separate 500 kilowatt hour batteries, so we can shut down one half to work on the other half without stopping the power. And this is what's required in order to maintain the run the well all night long. So, what sort of investment is something like this? Well, this was a prototype, so uh, in commercial manufacturing this would probably end up being about a, a six hundred thousand dollar battery and so given that they would amortize an investment like that over say a 30-year period presumably for utility infrastructure how does that compare to the alternative well what they did was they bought a ppa from a third party uh -huh. third party bought the battery the solar put in is putting in the whole system and they cut their utility rate in half. It's fixed for 25 years at 20 cents a kilowatt hour. Okay. So now we know so what the pencils. cost is going to be for 25 years, right? So all pencils, otherwise you, they wouldn't have done it. Uh, yeah, yeah, they're making money. And, you know, of course, the tax credits and subsidies have a lot to do with that. So that's a one megawatt battery, megawatt hour battery, and it has quite a bit of surge capacity in it. Like you said. There's the two banks of batteries can operate independently. So there's quite a bit of surge capacity in that battery and also quite a bit of time that that battery can run to put out one megawatt hour of power. The bigger isn't always better. Sometimes like in a disaster, you need to be able to get heavy batteries to remote locations and then use solar power to charge them. So Pastor Paul can show us a power cube that they use in the field. I had this on a show earlier this month and this is an example of a battery system that could be coupled with hydrogen to aid in a disaster recovery. But before we show that clip, we'll go to a quick break and we'll come back and I'll show you that clip of the smaller power cube battery. Aloha, I'm Catherine Knorr and I'm the host of Much More on Medicine on ThinkTech Hawaii. We talk about medical issues and I interview guests regarding medical matters and I'm really excited about upcoming guests. I hope you join us 
every other Wednesday at 3 p.m. Aloha and see you then. Aloha, my name is Becky Sampson and I'm the host of It's About Time. On the Think Tech Hawaii, a digital nonprofit organization that's raising public awareness. Join us on Wednesday at 2 p.m. where we talk about real issues. Some of the topics will include entrepreneurship, health, life skills, and growing your business. So once again, this is Becky Sampson on It's About Time on Wednesday at 2 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. Mahalo. Hey, welcome back to Stan the Energy Man with Stan Osterman and Pastor Paul Pontio from Puvava on the Big Island, where we're getting a sneak look at some of the cool things that he does in his church slash laboratory in the wilds of northern Big Island of Hawaii. We talked about the power cube on a show a couple shows ago, where Paul talked about taking this piece of equipment to a, a little event in the mainland called Burning Man, and he provided all the power that they needed for that. Uh, event with this power cube. So let's roll the video and see what Pastor Paul has to say about the power cube. This is all the solar panels and deploys in less than three hours. So we'll pump the container to what you see now in three hours. This is what it looks like when it's packed. Those are all the solar panels all the fittings and components, all of the poles, steel poles, and the beams, everything in there. Boom. So this can be paired with other eight foot cubes that have sanitation, refrigeration, water purification. This becomes the power source for a whole array of products that could be deployed fully charged in an emergency. A Chinook could sling three of these together, drop it off at a site, power within minutes to do whatever they need to do, and satellite communications that go on the roof too. Mm. So this just came back from Burning Man. We tested at Burning Man for its first test. Done. And as a, a typical day with the dust storms, this is what it powered. Wow. So all night Why long. didn't we know about this a month ago? <laughs> you right, Burning Man? No, but I could have, we could have been. Oh, okay. Well. A friend of mine, Larry Lieberman was there. Ah. You know Larry Lieberman? I know who he is. Yeah. He's, he's built one of these things too yeah. for uh, his folding windmill. Okay. Which they sold to Oshkosh. Yeah, that was called the Folly. It's an Irish group, Irish mm -hmm. camp. And they burned it at the end. Of course. Camp. But, uh, but yeah, it had a lot of lights and a sound system, a huge sound system. Oh, sorry. And this motorized windmill. So, how, well, how much juice is this put out? Well, it, on the inverter AC side, it can put out 12 or 24, depending on how we configure it. And it has 15 kilowatts of PV with the 32 panels that we have right now. So, that's, that's quite a bit of power for an emergency, like a triage center. You know, you could close this in. You can actually waterproof the panel so it, it stops it from raining. Uh, and do emergency surgery, triage, um, a command center for emergency site. Now I'm showing this to the county and to Helco because you know when Puna went down with the hurricane, mm -hmm. they were down for months without any power, the whole area in Puna. So if they had a few of these deployed, they could have had you know some power for people to come charge their laptops and phones and run it. Water purification, have a refrigeration for medicine. So these are your blue ion batteries? Yeah, them? so these are the same blue ion batteries. We're getting ready to build another one with a different battery and a different set of inverters. If you want to compare and test them. But only look in the Being a former military guy, I can attest to the fact that a piece of equipment like that, especially coupled and modified to do different jobs, would be a huge game changer for the U.S. military. So I think Paul and uh, the folks over there, Pastor Paul that is, are gonna be showing that to the folks at Pohakaloa Training, the Marines and the Army folks, and uh, hopefully we'll get some Air Force folks interested in that as well. And uh, see if we can get those things out to where they can be deployed for disasters and military operations. 
When it comes to hydrogen, one of the biggest challenges facing the Church of the First Element is the defeat of the blasphemous preachers of the Hindenburg disaster. The heathens that perpetuate this story appear at every turn and usually puff out their chests with an I got you this time moment as soon as they hear a hydrogen believer start to talk. But here Pastor Paul addresses the third commandment and rebukes the scandalous and slanderous allegations of the Hindenburgers that so will show him in action with his walk burner. This is, this is my theory, but I'll stick to it. So, as you saw here, the lack of radiant heat, right? The, the dirigible was painted with an aluminized waterproofing compound, right? That's what they painted the fabric with to make it waterproof. <coughs> Today we call that compound thermite, okay? Mm -hmm. In thermite lights, it burns incredibly hot and it can't be extinguished. It's impossible. It has to be consumed. <clears throat> so lightning struck the, the bladder, caught the thermite on fire, the skin started burning. Lots of radiant heat from that, I mean, an enormous amount. It ruptured the hydrogen bags inside and a huge hydrogen fireball ensued. That fireball is what saved the people yeah. below in the gondola from being baked to death. It pulled all of the heat, including the frame and the skin and the hydrogen heat, up and away from the people, mm -hmm. giving it time to hit the ground and then to scatter. That is the most plausible explanation for what happened. Right? And I mean, <clears throat> I would never have known it if it wouldn't have been for my experience with hydrogen and testing it. When I started 2012 <laughs> with this, the first time I lit this stove, I had it on a stick. <laughs> and it went, <laughs> I was like, that's it? <laughs> so I started learning more and more and more and more and more. And you see how visible this flame is? Yeah. And it's a beautiful flame too. Right? That's odorless, non-toxic, blah, blah, blah. So if you do know anything about the Hindenburg, you'll know that most of the people that died in the Hindenburg disaster jumped out of the gondola while it was well above the ground and literally fell to their death. But as Pastor Paul points out, one thing about hydrogen is it goes straight up, and it doesn't just go straight up at some leisurely pace. It goes up at 45 miles an hour, 60-something feet per second. In other words, in one second, hydrogen gas is six stories above you once it's released. So the, the, and it does absorb quite a bit of heat energy. So it pulled all the heat from the other burning elements on the Hindenburg away from the gondola. When the gondola got near the ground, the people that jumped out and ran had minor injuries, and they weren't even burned because the hydrogen was pulling the heat away from the Hindenburg. So if you really understand the physics, the chemistry, and the, the uh, forensics of the Hindenburg disaster, you would never critique a hydrogen person by talking about the Hindenburg. But to show you the never-ending love of hydrogen, Pastor Paul preaches the safety and the wonders of hydrogen cooking. The good pastor knows the value of hydrogen as stored energy, and hydrogen's value is a clean power when used with a fuel cell. But seldom do we hear about the hydrogen, how about, hear about hydrogen's lightness of heart, its love of freedom, and its propensity to fly like an angel to the heavens. So here's a rare look at Pastor Paul exalting the glory of hydrogen so that the world will understand that hydrogen is God's favorite gas. This is why I built it. I wanted to make a hydrogen stove, first of all, but we also built it to help train first responders. So I used to go with the California Fuel Cell Partnership and the New York Fi the City Fire Department and go to different fire stations all around the islands here, to the firehouses, and teach the guys, preparing them for fuel cell EVs, the facts about hydrogen and dispelling all the myths and misinformation, right? So there's basically, first of all, hydrogen is the most ab abundant element in the universe. Everybody knows that. It's one on the periodic table. It's the lightest and smallest as well. It's 14 times lighter than air, twice as light as helium. So it goes up at 45 miles per hour. That's 66 feet a second. 
So if you went 1,001, it's six stories away hmm. in a second. Wow. It's hauling ass. It's hard to keep it around. So the buoyancy is one thing that makes it safer than any other flammable gas. Because hydrocarbon gases are heavier than that. They flow like water. So they stick around. Uh, so in a classroom, usually with an eight-foot acoustical ceiling, I go, right, you got a leak of hydrogen. You make sure everybody can hear it in the back. <laughs> Conventional wisdom would be if there's a spark, it would explode. Right? Well, you could see a little bit of distortion maybe right there where it was actually converting it to water vapor. <laughs> but it's moving so fast, by the time it's an inch from the hole, it's hit air molecules and scattered to it's not even combustible mixture anymore. The ratio is not there anymore. That's already left the building before I even started talking about it. It hit the ceiling and went out the vents at the top. It'll go through drywall. The stuff is really hard to contain. Right? So that makes it safer than any other flammable gas. The second thing is that you're gonna have to come in close to this because since there's no carbon in this fuel, it's pure hydrogen. There's almost no radiant energy. I can put my finger. Cut, no touch on, on top. top. It's over five to a thousand degrees on top. On the side. But down here. Mm -hmm. Don't touch it. You touched it. I touched <laughs> it. Okay. I warned you. Because I'm a carbon-based life, life form. It likes to. It like to jump right out and get you. Yeah. Okay. So. But, yeah. Interesting. To put it in perspective. This watt burner. Mm -hmm. Way over two hundred dollars of use. Okay. We've never repainted it, we never touched it, okay? And it's because the lack of radiant heat, the heat goes straight up only, unless you put something in its way like a finger. <coughs> and that's cool. <laughs> so, I mean, none of this is heating up, or the paint would have been, the paint would have been oxidized, mm -hmm. you know, after yeah. 10 hours of use. Mm -hmm. So, that is the second thing, that if you have a leak and it ignites, it doesn't heat up everything around you. Have you ever seen the video of a gas car and a fuel cell car on fire? The difference is so dramatic. In 30 seconds, everyone in that car is burned. They're gone. The gasoline ruptured the tank. It engulfs the entire car in fuel and fire. The hydrogen is shooting a torch out the back where it leaked. So you got a six foot torch. And, and even it the gasket, the rubber yeah, the, the rubber on the windshield really, doesn't melt. There's yeah. no radiant heat. So brothers and sisters, you have to believe in hydrogen. You must keep the faith and preach the blessings of hydrogen to the world every chance. Hydrogen is the way, the energy, and the clean power storage the whole world can have for free. All you need to do is have faith and think hydrogen. It's a gas. So please visit Pastor Paul in Puvava and listen to his stories on hydrogen, and you too will become a believer. So until next week, Dan the Energy Man signing off. Aloha.